probably 12 years ago, I was uh, exactly in this room, a bit different and less technological, but uh, <laughs> talking about these very unique creatures that back then we honestly knew much less than now, I believe. Um, so for those that probably saw my previous talks, this is something that is not very new, but um, I think probably some people here may find this quite interesting. Um, oh, how do I go now to my slides here? Right, I like to start with thank you. Thank you, the sponsor that allowed this project to carry on in these past uh, three years. Um, I should, I'm pretty sure I put here also DOSC because it's been lately a very good help into supporting the survey ongoing in Dubai. Um, and just a quick introduction of the small team that we are working on at the moment uh, on this project. We are uh, all women, strangely, but we are, uh, we are all strong. And for those that maybe haven't seen previous talks, I just want to give an introduction of where these animals occur, because people are always thinking about these whale and dolphins occurring very far away. So just a few shots to let you know where do generally occur. And I'm sure you recognize the places. Some used to occur. And this is in the capital. I believe someone recognized the skyline. And uh, yeah, so they are much closer than what we think they are. And um, many people ask me, why bother studying these species, right? Okay, they're nice, but wh why really concentrating effort on uh, assessing these species? Well, whale and dolphins and porpoises, there are three main groups of called overall cetaceans. Uh, are really essential organs for the well-being of the marine ecosystem. They lately um, even more identify uh, as the main nutrient vectors of the marine ecosystem. So basically with their feces, they really are the main fertilizer that boost primary productivity, so plankton, and in turn, obviously, all the secondary species, including our fish stocks. So really looking into how to improve fish stocks, we should really look into the broad scale of how the marine ecosystem works and really identify all species that make a difference. Um, there are also efficient carbon footprint, uh, carbon sink in the way the whales is like 20 odd tons and uh, long live. And once he dies, obviously, he carried that massive amount of carbon in the abyss of the sea, and that stays for centuries, uh, even more. Um, and obviously, the interesting part of this new study that actually came out is that, yes, whales are very important for nutrient recycle, these recyclers. This were, was identified in the past, but actually, more and more, this role is being identified uh, really cruci uh, play crucially by also small cetaceans and especially in tropical waters and uh, in hot waters like here in coastal waters. So even small dolphins really play a crucial role into fertilizing the marine ecosystem. Um, there are also sentinels, what we call sentinel species. Uh, what does it mean? Well, they are known as top marine predators. They live long, they only eat fish. So basically they accumulate whatever contaminant is in the marine ecosystem. And by studying their situation, we can really have a direct assessment of how the marine environment is in a certain area. Um, so they are what we call ecological indicator of the whole marine ecosystem. And generally, if we manage to protect these top predator species, then we protect all species that stay in the level below. So um concentrating effort to spread the outcomes. Um, but what's the problem? Well, whale, dolphins, and porpoises at the moment they are among the most endangered animals on earth. Um, recent studies have highlighted that 26% of the total species of dolphins are considered endangered. 
Of those, 60% are coastal and 100% are river dolphins, because yes, some species of dolphins also occur in rivers, not only in open sea. Um, and uh, among the latest animals declared extinct, two were marine mammals. The Caribbean monk seal and the beige dolphins were declared extinct in the past uh, beginning of 2000, in this century. Um, and the problem is that threats that hamper their survival are still ongoing. And in many regions like this one, on top of threats is the fact that there is no information about the species and very few people know about their existence around here or what is the population doing, what are the threats that are specific for this area. So what we know here, um, is that since actually very preliminary data, data from the 1980s, 1990s, already highlighted that these species were actually endangered. Um, a original study uh, actually dedicated on dugongs in Abu Dhabi highlighted the decrease of dolphins uh, sightings of 71% within 13 years from 1986 to 1999. So, Figures were already alarming, um, but um, the data that we have accumulated show that at least three species are regular in this water. Um, we will see them in details, and uh, they are just living in the areas that are actually most anthropogenically impacted, like our coastal water. And if you consider uh, the development that this region, not only UAE, but the whole region had in terms of uh, constructions, uh, human uh, growth, populations, and land reclamation, uh, shipping lines, and ports. Uh, this really plays a massive impact on these species. So the question that we started asking is, how are the populations that live in this water on a sustainable path? What, how are they doing and what intervention are recommended to actually protect their long uh, survival in this water? So these are our two main questions. And um, from these questions, the UAE Dolphin Project Initiative was idealized already in 2012. So quite a long time ago, we are around and with the main scope to promote the conservation of whale and dolphins and porpoises in, and the local marine environment. Our main targets are, yes, scientific research to gather scientific information on the local population of the species, but also aiming to public awareness, to involve the public, to let the public know that these species exist, and education involving young generation and students to um, learn how to uh, <laughs> accumulate knowledge on the species, what are the techniques that we use, and possibly bring forward uh, the, the knowledge and the interest. Um, so at the moment, the UE Dolphin Project Initiative runs under Zayat University, is the main research uh, that is uh, um, running uh, as part of the university research. So what are we doing? We are mainly working on four big branches at the moment. Um, one is the Dubai Dolphin Survey, and that has been uh, finally started again in 2021, thanks to new sponsors, uh, following a preliminary survey that was run in 2013-14, um, always in Dubai water. Here you can see that the white lines are the old surveys and the color lines are the new surveys that has been running from 2021 to 2024. Uh, so we just uh, temporarily stop this uh, this spring. We also work on a stranded network initiative. This is targeting to uh, gather as much information as possible on the um, events uh, when these animals uh, strand on shore, generally dead. Um, and although it's a sad event, uh, from these animals we can really extract as much information as possible if scientists can attend this, uh, this event. And the data that we collected help us to uh, 
verify the species that occur here, uh, but also gathering all sorts of samples that can dip into the genetic taxonomy, uh, toxicology. We are running a project with um, American University of Sharjah and EPAA, and also understand the diet analysis, uh, diet of these uh, animals. We, since 2022, we expand uh, surveys, both based surveys on Abu Dhabi city. This is in collaboration with Environment Agency to com complement their uh, long-term monitoring uh, survey along the coast of the Abu Dhabi Emirates. We are concentrating on the city because I think they are the main areas where uh, we impact most of these species. And so understanding uh, if they occur, which frequency, which area are more uh, frequented by the species, we can really help the authority to identify mitigation measures to uh, protect them. The last big part of our project is you, public, citizen science. Huh? And this started, um, this was the first actually uh, starting point of this project when I said, okay, let's ask people if they actually see dolphins. That was back in 2012. It was a few survey questionnaires run in few marinas. Back then there was DOSC, and then Dubai Marina was a new marina, uh, almost kind of open, but not fully as today. And most of the people reported that they were seeing dolphins very in recent times, like within two months of my survey, right? So I would say, ooh, so this is not memories of the past. These animals are still occurring in this water. And that's what prompt to uh, carry on and uh, investigating more, uh, more these species in these waters. Uh, so the citizen science campaign Run uh, still running. We collect sightings from everyone. I just received the night uh, like super exciting sightings tonight. <laughs> Michelle can can uh, can uh, prove this. And uh, we not only collect the sightings, we use it. And uh, we utilize since uh, 2012 over uh, 1,300 sightings. At the moment, we are over 1,500 to try to understand how these species actually utilize the habitat. And uh, this, what you see, is the distribution of the sightings divided by species and all sightings reported by the public, just to have an idea where they occur. Obviously, is human present dependent, but still, if you see dolphins, it means that they are there. So it's a yes, uh, it's a yes data that is really important. Um, we also run... Uh, as scientists, scientists do, modeling analysis, and we try to pull all the data together, including uh, environmental variables like uh, presence of specific plankton, uh, temperature, salinity, uh, chlorophyll, and type of um, different level of um, environmental information that we can get. And, um, and we try to tease apart where these species mostly occur and if there is specific habitat where they occur. So in these slides, you can see here the areas where these species are mostly present in correlation to environmental variables, what describe their habitat. As you can see, in the Pacific fieldless porpoise, that is the little tiny one there, has got a very bigger range compared to the other ones. Botros dolphin does okay. But the species that have the tiniest and narrowest habitat is the Indian Ocean Amplex dolphin. They only occur basically close to shores. It's very similar to the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins in terms of correlation with other variables, environmental variables. But the main difference is difference from coast. So they do like very coastal water, very close to the shore like us. These data have been uh, uh, crucial to actually support the identification of important marine mammal areas in, uh, in UAE. Uh, into, this is a process that is ongoing worldwide, identifying areas that are important for the species and basically map them. Um, and uh, 
In 2019, it was the time of the Western Indian Ocean. So we pulled together the data again, together with the Environment Agency, and we managed basically to extend the important marine mammal area to the by waters, uh, thanks to the public data. But the public also reported amazing sightings, like today. <laughs> um, we, thanks for the public, we know that there are killer whales here. They are rare, but regular. There are humpback whales uh, that occur here. In fact, these that you can see here, let me see if this works. This is the sightings of a mother and calf in uh, November 2017, just in front of Dosk, actually Kite Beach. You can see at the very beginning. Eh? Um, mind. Humpback whales in this region is the only population in the world that is declining. We account about 99 individuals left. There, we know they roam from India to, um, to Oman. This is, this is actually quite amazing because the sighting was from a kite surfer. <laughs> they saw the whales while kite surfing. Um, and uh, someone here in the room can uh, can witness, uh, can remember the excitement of uh, the moment where we received this sighting. And I was like, is he a whale or is it a dolphin? Can it be a whale? But they are. Um, so again, other species are killer whales. Killer whales, we know now they regularly occur in these waters. They are rare, but they do come. And uh, thanks again to citizen science and joining citizen science project across the world, we even managed to track some individuals uh, as you can recognize the individual from the dorsal fin. So this is a picture from 2008, the occurrence of uh, uh, killer whales in Abu Dhabi. And uh, well, the same individuals have been sighted in Sri Lanka after a few years, 2015, and then back in, Abu in Dubai waters in 2017. So this is the first long range migration of this species um, that we, we basically uh, know about, thanks only for the public sightings. Um, another group of, dolph of killer whales, probably, I don't know if you remember last year, there were killer whales in Abu Dhabi. Those, again, those two individuals were sighted uh, before in Iran in 2018 and 19 and then in Abu Dhabi. So we can start putting together the data. So yeah, if you're out there and you see dolphins, please do report them. We have Instagram, Facebook, but I thought actually throughout the years, WhatsApp is the best and easiest way that people utilize to send the video. So please, if you scan the code that goes directly to a mobile number, that is my other mobile number for the project where all the data are collected and uh, we make use of them. No single sighting goes unused. So what about the species that occur here more recently that they are living with us? Well, we have three main species as I mentioned before. Uh, the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphins, kind of shark fin that you see there. The Indian Ocean Ampeg Dolphins, instead it has this hump, uh, recognizable, uh, and a tiny little fin. And the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise, this is a tiny little thing. It's like this, has no fin, dorsal fin, so uh, even more difficult to be seen at sea. But if it's very flat, you may encounter them. Um, Indian Ocean Ampeg Dolphins at the moment is also um, uh, the main target of a global initiative that actually uh, started thanks to the collaboration of Zayed University, University of Pretoria, and uh, St. Andrew University, um, Udonet, that is targeting uh, to uh, work in and joining uh, globally scientists and conservationists across the range of the species to uh, move forward for conservation measure. So how do we operate? Um, we run both way surveys, as many of you uh, know, um, and we want to assess the frequency of the species, 
estimate their distribution, which areas they utilize most, if there is a specific areas in Dubai waters. Um, also identify the range of the population. Are these individuals only living here? How far they move? Uh, how many they are, right? And also understand if there is, how the population is doing. Is increasing, decreasing, is stable? Um, and then we want to utilize all this information to uh, communicate to the authorities and support conservation measures for the species. So our Dubai Dolphin Surveys has been uh, running from Port Rashid, we tried a bit more data, we extended in there in the last uh, couple of years, up to Jebel Ali. Uh, the color lines are basically just for uh, identify which area we can focus for a day. Um, and to make sure that we homogeneously cover the area throughout our surveys. Obviously, it's difficult to see these animals. You need to have flat sea and uh, lots of eyes looking out for, uh, for the species. Uh, and obviously, we go to low speed uh, to make sure we can see them, actually. Uh, to date, we conducted 142 surveys. Uh, quite a long kilometers, uh, 11,000 almost kilometers in Dubai water following our transect. Uh, and we involve yeah, over 150 volunteers that help us looking for these species. Um, I'm doing something wrong. Ah, okay. So this is a bit of uh, already results. Uh, on the right, you can see how our effort has been obviously homogeneous, obviously not obviously, but we managed to cover homogeneously throughout the three years, the all areas of Dubai. Um, in total, we gathered 44 sightings of the species and 10 of those were finless porpoises. Uh, only two were humpback dolphins. And in these pictures, you can see a bit better uh, the general distribution uh, for species. Um, the light blue dots that you can see here, they are bottles dolphins. And uh, what you can see is actually the, the route that they took during the sightings, because we basically take position every five minutes when we are with the animals. Uh, the darker uh, green, they are bottles dolphin, but sighted in the first surveys 2013 and 14. And then you can see the yellow, Colors are finless porpoises for 2021, 23, so 24 survey. And in orange, the sightings of finless porpoises in the previous survey in 2013, 14. And at last, you can see the pink dots. Pink dots are the humpback dolphins in 2013 and 14. And this pink is only the two sightings we had in three years, covering the Dubai waters. And on the right, you see the overall general distribution of the species, so where mostly we saw them. And the comparison between 2013-14 surveys and 2021-24. Um, and you can see is a, definitely a different utilization of space. But when we tease apart the different species, we actually realized that it was not actually different utilization overall. So we look at more insight into bottles dolphins, sightings and compare 2013-14. And um, what we found is about, you know, uh, nine sightings in one year of surveys, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, we recorded, um, in 37 months, 32 sightings. So calculating a sighting rate that you calculate dividing sightings by uh, kilometers. Eh? Or we basically have more or less the same sighting rate in the two different surveys. As you can see, it seems that uh, they utilize a wider areas of the, of the water, mainly, yeah, just offshore, but not that much. We are about, 10 Ks of sure there, um, even less. Then we look at the fearless purposes and uh, comparing 2013-14 surveys with uh, to the, the most recent one. Um, also, we look at the sighting rate and 
these species almost appear, also appear quite stable in terms of frequency. But when we look at the ampeg dolphins is where we found the most drastic difference and explain why the overall distribution look very different. Um, on the top, you can see where they used to occur in the first surveys, um, and they were almost the most frequent species with eight sightings. And uh, now we have we had only had two sightings. So with the sighting rate decreasing of one order of magnitude. This is a lot for a species uh, in only 10 years. So if you calculate these data, I estimated a 90% decrease. That is quite concerning. As a good scientist, you're never sure about your data. So I went back to the public data. And uh, I tried to tease them apart for years, right? And uh, I divide them in two blocks. So from 2014, 2017, and then from 2018, 2021, that was the main blocks that uh, I, I analyzed. And um, you can see here the number of sightings reported by the public uh, from uh, um, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and overall in UAE. And um, amazingly, finless porpoises, seems they're actually increasing. And this is very interesting because if the public report the tiny little dolphins that is almost invisible, means that they actually do report quite carefully, right? <laughs> it's not just by chance that I have this data. But the other species, well, Botros dolphins in Dubai, they're not doing that bad. Um, in Abu Dhabi, there is a more decrease in sightings, uh, but the drastic, that I was hoping not to see, but I did, is the extreme decline all over the presence of, uh, and the reporting of humpback dolphins. So from this data, we calculated a 56% decrease. So probably it's the reality is some in between the two data. Um, so this species really needs urgent attentions from everyone, not only the authorities, but the public, the private stakeholders. And uh, they unfortunately see the same trend all over their range, not only in UAE. So what do we do also other than collecting sightings? Well, we take pictures of individuals. We like pictures. <laughs> but actually, we utilize pictures to recognize the single individual so we can actually track them. Uh, from the dorsal fins, both botanols and ampeg dolphins can be clearly recognized, uh, especially if they are adults. So we can try trace them and also identify exactly um, or provide a better estimate of the number of individuals that occur in the area and how resident they are. Because obviously, if you always see the same people or the same dolphins, means that they are the group that occur in the area. If you keep on seeing new ones, means that the population either is very, very big or they are moving around and they are not staying. But these actually, they are pretty resident. So this is just one of the examples. So Hamda, what is been named, um, we saw it in 2013-14 and uh, it was happily back in Dubai waters when we started the new surveys, actually with a baby that we tracked in a number of sightings. Um, so yeah, they're here for a good decade and even more. So quite, quite resident. Um, also these data are utilized to understand an average group size, the difference between the species, how much reciting rate we have. So how many individual we recited for bottomless dolphin, we are about 25%. And all these data then they will be pulled in again, mathematical modeling that I spare you. Uh, to try to estimate the population size of the species in a more precise way. We also started what uh, we call passive acoustic monitoring, meaning that we now have five different devices placed around the uh, Dubai coastline. These devices are small, they are anchored at the, uh, at the bottom, but they keep recording sound. 
Dolphins produce two types of sounds. One are the whistles that you are used because we can hear them. And the other ones are clicks. And clicks are very high frequency that they utilize to echolocate. So this device collects all the clicks that are produced. And uh, we can know when dolphins are in a certain place. The radius is about one and a half kilometers, maybe two kilometers. So we can map when we see dolphins. This is just uh, an example. These are the day of the year for the time of one deployment uh, that we mapped. Uh, this is the water temperature. They also take water temperature. You can see the position of the device, but these are the clicks. So we can know exactly which day there was a sightings. We can also, the device can also distinguish between fearless porpoises and dolphins. Worldwide, we are now trying to tease apart with other specialists the, if we can distinguish bottlenose dolphins and humpback dolphins, but we're still working on that. Uh, but we can really map for every day and where we see dolphins. We cannot take pictures, but we can know that they were there. And these data have been crucial because we basically managed to overlap our sighting of the survey, the public sighting, and the sound sightings. And we can now confidently say these dolphins do not occur only in spring and winter and autumn. They are here all year round because they are detected. So maybe they utilize the water in, in, during the night, not during the day, and during the day they're somewhere else. Anyway, they are basically here all the time. We can also utilize this water to understand uh, during, you know, in which part of the day they occur in a certain area. Uh, this was the plot of uh, a device that we placed in Palm Jamira. And uh, this is the accumulation of basically for every hour of the day across five months. And uh, we just saw when mostly Dolphins occur. And as you can see, they occur during the night or early morning. And they somehow avoid the busy time of the, of the day. This was placed basically just in front of the, one of the marinas that uh, face out of the pond, so close to Tiara buildings, right? <laughs> and uh, it is very interesting to try to understand um, What's the meaning of this? Are they avoiding traffic? And they are coming only in the, uh, in the day, in the time of the day where there is quieter uh, uh, and less noise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, at the moment, we are uh, counting all the encounters. I have new data that we just collected a few weeks ago from locations. So we are piling up information. <laughs> Obviously, during the, the surveys, we collected also lots of data on other species as we are using petrol, we maximize the information. So we now collected over 1,500 Socotra cormorant sightings, turtles, sea snakes, and dugongs. We had the dugong sightings in Dubai. Um, and obviously we can do another presentation on this, I just keep. <laughs> but these are all data that will be utilized uh, to provide information for these species. In Abu Dhabi, the survey is still ongoing. Um, and we focus not only on the areas that we, you know, we think is uh, areas for dolphins. We really go into the channels of the city because again, the public reported sightings up to our Raqqa beach. So we say, how is, how frequently are actually in those areas inland? Um, at the moment we have, 28, because they have a sighting today. They were out, um, my researchers. And uh, um, you can see here the distribution of the, of the species. You have once we had one sightings of fearless porpoises just in front of the, of the Emirates Palace. Uh, actually, this was for dugongs, with dugongs. We have one bottlenose dolphin sightings, was just uh, off Nurai Island. And all the others are humpback dolphins. Humpback dolphins love Abu Dhabi. <laughs> they are all around. 
Albertine channels is one of the their preferred areas where they occur. Um, but this again raised the concern of how long can they survive with our uh, with our presence there, and what can actually do and su suggest to the authorities uh, to actually mitigate our impact on the species and keep on having them living on our doorsteps. So more of the survey in the next years. Um, strandings. So strandings is a bittersweet topic. Nobody wants to talk about it, but actually they are really, really important. Um, being able to attend strandings allows to have an estimate of the mortality of the species, but also most importantly, to try to identify the cause of death. And uh, this allowed us to identify the threats that probably cause death. Um, and also all the samples collected can really be crucial, especially in areas where we don't know much. So the moment we, um, we managed to utilize the stomach contents to assess what bottlenose dolphins preferably eat here. Uh, someone here could talk more better than me as uh, she's been the, the one running these studies. Razan. Um, and uh, how do we do this? We literally collect the whole stomachs when we have a stranding, we actually do a full necropsy if we allow to append the strandings and we know about the strandings. That's the main important thing, right? Is getting to know that these animals are stranded. Um, but when we can, we do a full necropsy measurement and we collect as many samples as possible. Among these is the stomachs and looking at the remains in the stomachs, we can really identify the species. Uh, the most utilized tools to identify fish species is the otoliths. These are little ear bones that fish had, and obviously they have two, so we can count how many fish there were in the stomachs, and also we can identify which species of fish they were in the stomach. So we can have a, a clear map of what the dolphins have eaten, have eaten before, unfortunately, the sad event. Um, but also looking at the stomach contents can tell us whether this dolphin died because it was sick. And usually we don't have many fish inside or none, as we do. We don't eat when we are very sick. Or if it was a full stomach, then we need to look into threats that probably affect this animal while it was in full health and sometimes while it was feeding. We also utilize the samples collected for running toxicological analysis and understand uh, what's the level of contaminants in these waters. And uh, in collaboration with the EPAA and American University of Sharjah, we managed to pull together the data for the first publication looking into uh, different type of contaminants from PCD, uh, organochlorine, and uh, uh, plastic and petrol derivatives and heavy metals. Um, the good news is that uh, we well we run these analyses only on whale samples. We are running the one on uh, dolphin samples. But the good news for that we came out from this work is that these whales are the cleanest whales in the world. In other parts part of the world, contaminants level are out of you know over the roof. But here it seems they are actually pretty clean. That is encouraging because. Pollution is one of the main threats for these species. The only signal we had was for some low molecular weight of PAH. They are related to petroleum um, uh, uh, production, yes, products, but you know, literally nothing compared to other species in the world. So this is a very good news for this. We also run a review of all the information we could gather across the years about strandings in UAE. And uh, we collected basically all information that are, they were on internet, newspapers, uh, obviously reported by the public or in the latest 10 years, stranding that we actually I directly attended. 
And uh, this is the trend of uh, overall number of uh, strandings. We are about a bit more, we are at 128 now. Um, but this is the kind of trend. On the blue line, what you see is the overall number of strandings. And in the orange, um, in the orange color, you can see only the number of whales that stranded. Um, and the concerning point is the not only the general increase of strandings. We cannot really say much about that because at least uh, we don't know how, how much strandings, how many strandings were reported before. Uh, but what is concerning is, especially for whales, is the last three years. We had a total of 15 individuals stranded in, in UAE uh, that we are not, we know about. Um, and this is a big number because, uh, as I said, for example, humpback whales, it's one of the most endangered population. We don't know about the other whale populations here. And definitely these numbers are not sustainable. Also considering that UAE coastline is only a small part of the whole Gulf and the region. And these whales for sure, they don't live all the time in the Gulf, they move around. Um, so we don't know. Uh, and we're working together with international collaborators to now to try to pull all the information together to have a better idea of the numbers. My question was, so if these whales come dead to shore, there must be a life somewhere. And um, that's where we were lucky. And last year, we managed to join the Ocean X Expeditions. This is a philanthropic initiative uh, sponsored by Dahlia Family and Bloomberg. Big, big names. And they have this fantastic research vessel that is one of the most advanced vessels in the world. And they came here in collaboration, obviously, with the UAE government and uh, supporting local researchers. That's their uh, main uh, target, bringing the oceans to the people. Um, and uh, so we, we propose our little programs to try to look for whales, like the needle in the haystack. And uh, we found them. We were, uh, this is one of the two individuals that we saw in the middle of the ocean. As you can see, it was a rough sea, so not very lucky from our side. But this was one of the 12 sightings that we recorded covering part of the offshore areas. And uh, that was the very first survey that has been run offshore for the dedicated to these species. Um, we had 11 sightings of bottlenose dolphins and that's the way in sightings. So they are out there. <laughs> they are out there. The problem is that we really don't know much about what they're doing, how frequent they are, how many. So now that is the next stage of the research that we are trying to, to push for uh, to gather more information for these species. We were also very lucky of uh, having sponsored uh, the full genome sequence analysis for six samples that we collected from previous strandings. So we are now pushing for whole genome sequence and try to get more information from the genetic side, both to uh, really confirm the species, but also to identify how these species are, if they're the same species they occur somewhere else or they are unique populations or how different they are or how similar they are from the one outside the Gulf. Um, and um, what all these told us is that definitely we need to look into more data from the offshore waters, uh, especially for whales. Uh, these individuals, I mean, these species are really, um, considering the number of strandings that we witness, they really need a clearer, uh, close attention. Um, we saw them while they were feeding. So it means that probably they utilize this water not just passing by, they feed here. So maybe the Gulf has this particular, particular krill that is better uh, than the one outside to come all the way here, eh? we don't know. Um, but the sad thing is that, as you saw from the picture, one individual was scarred badly 
So there are threats out there that they need really clear identification to try to mitigate them. Um, overall, our data suggests that these populations here are here, but they are not in gay shape. Uh, across all species, we see a low density of these species. So, um, and because they are in coastal water, they really need urgent attentions to try to mitigate, identify better the threat, threats and mitigate their effect. Um, the other interesting point is that uh, most of the time, these species, because they are such in low density, they go completely um, uh, undetected by all impact environmental assessments. So um, I think the main uh, use of this data is to really, and these surveys, is to really provide authorities and stakeholders with an up-to-date map of where they occur. And this can be utilized as a layer to obviously consider them in any activities. Um, it's interesting, they live with us. So we just need to make sure we can coexist with them to ensure their survival in the future. And uh, the case of the humpback dolphins in Dubai tells us they actually can disappear pretty fast if we don't take the right measure. Um, but in Abu Dhabi, they're still occurring. So we're now working to see how many individuals overlap and where they moved. Uh, and I believe that given the chance, they will come around. Uh, we just need to identify how we can favor that. And overall, you know, threats that affect cetaceans are always the same. Uh, bycatch is actually one of the most important threats worldwide, following by pollution, habitat loss, in these order, ship strikes, depending on the species that can vary in order. But the, I think the, the sign that is positive here is that um, we see habitat loss and degradation as the most impactful threats. They don't have much pollution, contaminants, so that's not the main problem here. Eh? But disturbance and ship strikes, they are probably among the main causes uh, of, uh, of concern. Um, we haven't run a bycatch survey among fishermen, but I believe that with the signal that we have, if there were bycatch, a really serious bycatch problem, we will see more mortalities on the shore, but we don't know yet. Um, but also considering the type of fisheries that are here, especially in coastal waters, I doubt that it's gonna be one of the main causes. The good thing is that these threats can be mitigated. Pollution is more difficult, but this, if we identify how to favor the presence of the species can be actually mitigated with clear measures and protections. Um, so what are we aiming for the future? Well, definitely supporting the formulation of dedicated protection measure for the species and working with all authorities and stakeholders to try to pull together the best information we have to move forward with uh, uh, conservation measures that are dedicated to the species. Um, obviously connect regionally with other scientists, pull together data and join forces across the region is also important. We are also in contact obviously with the most uh, international and relevant organization like CMS and IUCN and now the Indian Ocean Reporting Network. Um, and obviously increase awareness. Awareness is always important. So we try to publish in any magazine, probably here someone knows about the Emirates Diving Association magazine, but we also uh, put forward our data and in international forums like the International Whaling Commission, um, we present to different co conventions and the conference internationally. Um, our volunteers are a strength, so we're not running surveys at the moment, but please, if you want to join, we will hopefully start soon. And it's really, uh, it's really rewarding to see how much they not only enjoy, but they learn being out in the ocean.
and obviously education and through the university um, we are trying to push for the next generation to be involved hands-on in this type of research and we had a number of students that uh, joined the project in different aspects uh, and different parts and different uh, uh, techniques that we utilized. So, well, I hope you enjoy your sightings when you see them and please do report them. We really, really uh, utilize any information to try to protect these species in UAE. And thank you very much. Yes. Um, for dolphin sightings, you can also retroactively give this information. Like we were able to say, hey, there was a sighting eight months ago. We can still give it all. Okay, just want to clarify. Next question is Have you or your department been able to incorporate AI into dolphin identification, either through dorsal fin identification, or what is it? Yes, how you've been doing it. What do you see in scientific advancements and you'll do that better? Yes, yes, we are actually testing uh, a few systems, uh, both here and internationally, uh, to try to facilitate this uh, eye recognition of the fins because it's a long, long process. You have this, maybe you come back home with one sightings and you have like 2,000 pictures, 3,000 pictures, right? So you need to go and just eliminate all the ones that you didn't get right <laughs> that is a big part but then looking at the fins one by one and um, we can get for the species recognition but that's fairly easy um, when we get to individuals we are actually running now uh, a ai uh, system and our eye system and still you can get there but still we are learning um, I think I think AI is, there is the potential out there. It's not applied to dolphins yet. Um, so you can uh, I, the the program identify very clearly the really um, you know well marked fins, but when you get to the one less marked, it doesn't recognize it. So our eyes are still quite a strong uh, system, uh, but I'm sure we are getting there. And we are working for an algorithm for humpback dolphins because obviously uh, not all algorithm works for all the fin shapes. So we're working on that too. Hi, this is from um, Eliza. She says, are the dolphins you see around Dubai the same as the dolphin families that live in the Musan Dam? Are they shipped, uh, um, uh, are they shipped so that you can see the way they move along? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, we are working on that in the way that um, there's been no survey covering the Northern Emirates. And uh, we are in the process to try to obtain the, the permits from the Northern Emirates and try to cover the area. Although in all this year, despite our presence and some presentation in Ras al-Khaimah Natural uh, History Group and Malquain and contact with the marinas, we rarely receive sightings from this area. Um, we also know from historical data and recent data that uh, humpback dolphins do occur in the Musandans, but then on the East Coast, they are completely absent until after Sur in Oman. So there is almost, what is 800 kilometers of disappearance of the species that have always been there. And I think that probably is the same that happens on this side of the coastline, uh, where the northernmost area is now Jebel Ali, or say Dubai, but they do not move to Musandans. And there are no species that will go offshore and then come back. They will never go ashore. So my guess is they are not. They are not the same families. Uh, I'm aware that uh, the Ministry of Oman is now started surveys to monitor the populations there uh, of dolphins. So hopefully we can compare data in the future. The most interesting part for me was that the government states that the Dubai waters is the whole year. 
even in summer when the water temperature goes up. I thought that summer they go somewhere. So they can adapt to the higher temperature. That's interesting. Second thing is, uh, you know, in turtles, they die mainly from plastic ingestion. Dolphins, no? No, we haven't, we never found plastic, yeah. and especially these species of dolphins. Other type of dolphins and whales, they do get affected by plastic. And especially they are the deep divers um, that feed on uh, big cephalopods, like big squids. They are affected. So if you look in sperm whales, they can have massive amount of plastic in their stomach. Uh, big whales also, and other species, but not this one here. In our stomachs, we never find plastic. Even small, we didn't find. I've got one coming online. So, um, Mohammed um, Ray Ahmed says, How many species of dolphins are present in the Gulf? Yes, that's a good question. Um, can you please put the QR code on the screen again? Sure. Um, Crystal says that she highly recommends volunteering. And the question so, there seems to be more nighttime dolphin activity in the UAE. So are humans possibly affecting the dolphin circadian rhythm, or are they more act are they more active at night, even in natural environments? Okay. Um, so there are about thirteen species, fourteen species of whale and dolphins in UAE water. This is including also, this is in the Gulf water. Yes. Obviously, East Coast they have a bit more because there are species that. Uh, uh, they are more adapted to open water and uh, oceanic waters. But in the Gulf, we have 14 species uh, confirmed. Um, regarding the second question, well, dolphins don't really follow patterns like sleeping during the night or during the day, but definitely our presence can impact the utilization of certain waters uh, in for example, due to our presence and the, the disturbance that we uh, determine. Um, some species of dolphins um, swim and are more active at night. Um, for example, uh, spinner dolphins, they generally feed offshore during the night, and then during the day they come inshore and they, uh, they rest. But other species, they just utilize the day and the night time differently. Uh, so I don't think that will disturb their circadian rhythm, but uh, definitely they disturb how they can utilize a, an area or uh, affect their ability to feed on the prey. She is uh, seeing a lot of creatures nowadays right very close to the beaches. Is this a good sign or this is a bad sign? If they come close. Yeah, very close to the beach where people are swimming. It's their environment. They they do come because that's what they used to do, especially unpack dolphins. If you go to Sadia, sometimes they, they you can see them on the shore. Um, and that's very natural. Obviously, for me, it's a bit concerning because they're big animals. So for people to swim with the dolphins is something that I never recommend. So they are 350 kilos, right? But my point is that uh, early days we don't see this much, but nowadays they are becoming so so close. So is that maybe like there is not there is less feed because of the land inclination and so so become so close, or it's just like they are now becoming so friendly to the people, so they just come more to the shore. Or is it the shipping lanes or something? No, mm -hmm. I think I I don't know honestly because I don't know the early days. Okay. Honestly, and also depend on the species. Um, so bottlenose dolphins, they will not come close, but humpback dolphins, they will come close. Um, and maybe I don't know, early days, that would be a very point, a very good point to, you know, to investigate. Um, I think we need to look into some people that have been here long enough to address that, but it's a good point to address. Online from uh, Mohammed Ali Khan. He says, Thank you for a wonderful uh, knowledge enhancing presentation. 
of whales and dolphins. Is there any interactive forum for UAE or Arabian cetaceans where we can participate, like in Facebook, WhatsApp, or LinkedIn? Uh, yes, there is a Facebook page and there is a LinkedIn page of the project. Um, I think if they Google UAE Dolphin Project, they should find the link. Um, we are not very active because uh, at the moment we are pretty busy, but uh, uh, usually we'll try to cover them. <laughs> Or there is no difference in terms of uh, geography. Yeah. Or, uh... Generally, they don't. It's not like turtles that you can identify areas uh, where obviously they reproduce. Um, but here, I don't think there is enough information to even uh, address that. Uh, we do see them with calves in all season. Obviously, you know, dolphins takes. Like uh, you know, uh, for a for a dolphins to let's say to be independent, it takes three years generally, three four years. So for all that period, it stays with the mothers, and that's why we can also through through the photo identification identify the mortality rate of calves. Because if you don't see them with the mother after one year, it means that it didn't make it. Um, but there are no specific areas that um. I I can see. Um, is, what is the this um, sighting of a whale? Yes. Today? Yes. Yes. Well, that is today. Yes. <laughs> I just received it yes. this uh, this evening. Okay, I don't know how you can project it to show them. From Gary, who says, is there any significant significant dolphin data from the Iranian side of the Gulf or the Indian Ocean coast? Uh, is there any significant dolphin data from the Iranian side of the Gulf or its oh, Indian Ocean yes. coast? Yes. Uh, so from Iran, there are a, a couple of groups that are working, but the, the the information in the Gulf is very limited. Um, I'm in collaboration. Well, I'm supervising a researchers in Kuwait that is running now since 2020 surveys dedicated again from unpicked dolphins and is really pushing for more information in Kuwait. I'm aware there is uh, some research ongoing or surveys, more research ongoing in Qatar and also Saudi is having a big push both in the Red Sea and obviously in the Gulf to gather information on the species. And uh, yes, in Iran, uh, um, there are a couple of groups that are working um, on these species at the moment, but in very limited area. Iran is a long coastline, so for sure more effort is needed to have a comprehensive information. Any more questions? Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, can you go back to your second last slide? You had some advice for dolphin whale supporters. I only read the first two bullet points. This one. Yes, one. Yes, thank yes. you. This is this is simply to advise, especially sailors or whoever has a boat, um, how to approach dolphins. Uh, there are ways you can really easily approach dolphins without really interfere on them. And uh, I always give the examples of uh, you know, if you're working in a mall. If someone really walks behind you, it's scary. The same as someone comes directly to you, right? If someone approaches you on the side, it's much more friendly. Same approach with dolphins. And obviously, these are international guidelines. Um, you should try to stay 50 meters from dolphins. But most of the time, if you approach them on the side, they come to you. And that's absolutely fine. You know, It's their choice to come. It's not you approaching and harassing them. And uh, we always uh, suggest a bit more distance for whales, 100, 150 meters. But again, if they approach you, unless they're killer whales, then it's better if you run. Uh, but if they approach you, you can, you know, you can uh, be sure that that was a voluntary action from their side. Yeah. Yes. 
key basic silly question that you really people ask. So when dolphins are approaching the doves, uh, you know those doves which usually go in uh, Mosanda and cruises and so on, and the guys are always telling you start clapping, they like this uh, sound, so they will all come and so on. Is it really so or what's the reason why they are approaching? Dolphins are curious. They definitely approach because they want to check out what it is. And uh, if they don't want that, you won't see them because they hear us before we see them. So uh, that's the, the bottom line. Because it actually feels like, yeah, when we all start like clapping all this, oh, they all start, you know, jumping and, you know, go. I think they will do it in any case. I don't think it's something that, uh, but obviously like maybe maybe they are checking out and say, what the heck are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't people why are you why are you so noisy, right? Uh, because they are pretty intelligent and uh, so they, they will pick up. But obviously they, they come to the boat because they're curious, because the boat moves in that direction. So they they seek that connection. I think that they are just on the payroll of the whole company. <laughs> No, 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 no. They, the, the, the thing is that when that traffic becomes too much for the population to actually do their own, uh, you know, uh, needs like feeding or socializing, uh, that's where the disturbance becomes unsustainable on the long term. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. Now one, and then we're going to. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. That's very interesting. Um, I have a question, maybe you both know there, but uh, how do you differentiate different dolphins? How do you know that this dolphin, that's the one that appeared a year ago here? Okay, well, we do recognize them directly from the feet. So um, let me just uh, get here an example. Ah, here. So, or maybe here. This one. So they literally have fins that are different, like our faces. So you really just look at the fins and you know which dolphin it is. They especially adults collect uh, marks and scars and notches. They just naturally scars like our scars. So you can really recognize that. Um, here, for example, this is pearl. It's got 